Welcome back to A Better Love with Dr. Greg. I'm here with Dr. Payne and Mortimer in the background there. Dr. Payne, thanks so much for joining the show again. Thank you again for having me. Yeah, today we've got a very interesting conversation that was asked for by our audience members about breakups. And so we're going to talk about, we're going to try to fit as much as we can into 30 minutes about what our audience really needs to know about overcoming breakups. And I've got a few different scenarios because we can find ourselves breaking up at various points in a relationship. In general, uh, Dr. Becca, what are your thoughts? Just about every single person who is privileged enough to make it into adulthood will have to endure a breakup at some point in their life. Even those few people that spend their entire life with one person, typically at some point in there, there's a breakup, even if they end up getting back together. So I think, yeah, that's a pretty, it's a pretty universal phenomenon that people go through. And relationships, I try to mention this to my folks who are getting married, the clients I work with and uh, who have been married for a little bit. Uh, to make the point that the average romantic encounter, r romantic relationship, I mean, I'm talking from like the first message on Hinge or some dating app to three to four months is the average duration of that. It's So it, our connection to one another, our starting relationships, very fickle. The fact that we make any of them work, I think is pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that, but that, you know, sounds about accurate. Yeah, yeah. Folks are getting broken up with more and more shocking ways more recently. I've written about this in psychology today about the spike in gray divorces. So folks, particularly men, uh, are finding themselves in situations where their marriages are ending, their relationships are ending in sort of shocking ways. Uh, Becca, a quick question for you. Who is ending most ro romantic relationships, would you say, and what you see and, and what you know is in heterosexual relationships specifically? Men or women? That's an interesting question. And I'm not sure that I can generalize. I think in a lot of the relationships that I see, it's almost unclear who the actual breaker upper is. Mm. Every once in a while, it'll be obvious, but a lot of times it's a series of events and um, issues that happen. And at some point it just kind of, it becomes too much and they go their separate ways. So there's something um, more mutual about that in your view. Uh, I wouldn't say mutual. You're reminding me when you asked that question of a show that was on MTV many years ago called The Blame Game. Okay. Where <laughs> each, each member of the broken up relationship would come and they would both state their case and then the audience would vote as to whose fault it was. Yeah. But um, I mean, I think it's kind of, I think it depends who you ask who's yeah, doing yeah. most of the breaking up. I've got some data in front of me. So I cheated a little bit here, but I, I got some data in front of me that suggests that when you ask uh, folks who have either been broken up with or do the breaking up, that women are almost two times more likely to say that they have, they are typically the ones breaking up with their boyfriends, fiancés, husbands. And actually that's interesting because divorces, we it's that there's actually pretty clear data that women in heterosexual relationships are the ones by and large initiating those uh, wow. breakups. My heart goes out to especially men, if I have any men, I, I hope hopefully there are more and more men back up listening to the show and, and following our project. But in general, like what if you've just been broken up with and it seems like it's come out of the blue to you, what are your top tips for people just to kind of get grounded? So I guess the first tip I would have, and this is one that a lot of people really struggle with, is to allow yourself to feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. So many times I talk with people, either whether they're my friends or patients, where they'll tend to do everything they can to distract themselves, whether that is going out and meeting somebody else or just staying incredibly busy or using drugs or alcohol, which is, tends to be the worst thing you can do. But allow yourself to feel your feelings. It's going to hurt. It's supposed to hurt. The only way out of it is through it. Yeah, absolutely. It's It's going to hurt. You know, if there's one thing you hear from us throughout this episode is that heartbreak's a real deal. And particularly if it's shocking, uh, I think the thing that stands out to me for folks that I've ever worked with, talked with, is making sense of what is happening in that moment. Because if it happens in a shocking way, as some of our listeners might attest to, uh, it doesn't make sense. Do people spend too much time, would you say, Becca? trying to get answers from their partner who has broken up with them, or maybe not enough time, 
trying to make sense of, in, in other words, actually pinning down a reason why the thing is ending? I think people inevitably, it obviously, it always depends on the person and on the relationship and on what happened. Mm -hmm. um, people definitely will spend a lot of time trying to determine what it is. And they'll spend, whether that's time that they're racking their brain thinking for thinking about what moment it actually went wrong, thinking about, oh, maybe if I had just, if I just said this one thing differently, then we'd still be together. Oh, if I just hadn't gone on that trip, if I just hadn't done this, there's a lot of self-blame and kind of blaming of external circumstances after a breakup, particularly a shocking one, but really even the ones that could have been predicted, people tend to spend a lot of time focusing on and hyper-focusing on what went wrong. I almost think it doesn't really matter what went wrong. <laughs> okay. The bottom line is that if you guys were supposed to be together, you would be together. So something went wrong. Mm -hmm. And maybe the focus is better spent on, okay, like, how can I move on? What do, what worked for me in that relationship and what didn't work? What do I want to go differently in my next relationship? Yeah, but I so understand that, that that can be really hard when you're fixated on your former partner. Yeah, yeah. So if it's initially, I first of all, I'm, I'm on board with what you're what you're suggesting here. If it's initially, there's going to be some some uh, maybe some rumination around that, particularly if you're a, a big thinker, a cognizer like myself, for instance. I'm I, I'm that kind of person who thinks a lot and often. So there might be some of that. And there's going to be trying, you're going to be trying to figure some stuff out. You may not get an answer from your, the person who has broken up with you. In other words, that's going to satiate this idea of why it didn't work out. And so, yeah, to your point, uh, if there was an interest effort made, whatever, to try to address things and it didn't work out in general, focused on yourself, your needs, your wants, and the process of moving forward and toward your future, definitely beautiful, uh, attitude to have. Yeah. Theoretically. I mean. It's really easy to say that when you're not going through a breakup. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And particularly depending on how messy it gets. I and mean, we're just going to keep getting messier and messier with these <laughs> examples maybe. But what do two people who are living together do next? So, yeah, that is, that is definitely messy, um, especially if there are finances that are tangled up together. That can, again, depend. I mean, certain there are times where financial people's financial situations won't allow them to physically separate, even if they've emotionally separated. Absolutely. That, and that is a really difficult situation. It also, you know, in some situations, there is an emotional separation only on one party. One party wants to stay together, one party doesn't, but you're still living together. It makes it really incredibly difficult to heal if you're still with that person all the time. Some people break up and never move out. And they just live together apart for years. Each relationship is different. And I think in an ideal world, you want to probably separate as soon as you can, but it's not always possible, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that you're making these, these points about the constraints, particularly around finances. Uh, we live in Los Angeles. Uh, we understand how difficult it is. Uh, to live in a, an expensive city, and we're folks that are doing pretty well. So depending on our social constraints, uh, which is, by the way, been one of the primary reasons, I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, but why, the primary reasons why people would stay uh, together, even not oh, yeah. broken up, but just stay together in general, because Absolutely. of some of these reasons that we're talking about right now. Yep. There are, I've seen statistics that during times of recessions, divorce rates go down and domestic violence rates go up. And that's just the sad truth that yeah. divorce is expensive, separating is expensive. And so, yeah, you might be going through this right now. You may be listening to this right now and trying to figure out what you're going to do. I think in an ideal situation, as Dr. Payne has suggested, in an ideal situation, you're able to have a, you know, responsible adult conversation with someone who you've been likely sharing finances and financial responsibilities with. I would suggest one of the data points you might look at is like, who is, right? Who is in a position uh, logistically or financially that has the, mo the, the more, op more options to be able to find another space to be in and, and then to have patience with one another as you, 
as you try to make that happen as soon as you can with relatively increasing and clear boundaries around your space and time if you are going to be living together in general. Would you say those are yeah pretty good? I think that's those are all you know great tips. I think communication is going to be key in a situation like this. Um, communicating where you are financially, communicating a timeline, communicating what your boundaries are while you are remaining living together, working together to as cordially as possible, determine what those boundaries are and respect those boundaries. Yeah. And if you have a dog, I'm, th I'm thinking about this because your dog is sitting behind you or lying down <laughs> yes. behind that, that might be one of those things is like, okay, well, you're here and the, you know, usually you walk the dog or, you know, I mean, you may be having these very specific conversations about what will continue to happen while you're figuring things out and what, you know, may just have to change, uh, dog walking included. I know exactly come up, it's come up. Uh, if t Becca, if, if couples are together for a while, um, let's say at least five years, uh, maybe longer, uh, their bond is going to, their attachment is going to be pretty likely deep, you know, in their day to day life. Like they're just part of each other's life. How long does it take? And I know this is a general question. You're going to say it depends, but how long does it, <laughs> how long does it take if you've been really attached to somebody? Like they've been a really big part of your life for you to get a sense of like normal without that person. Yeah. I mean, you know what I'm going to say. And it, you know, it depends not only on the person, on the relationship. Um, the level of independence and codependence that was existing in the relationship. As a general rule, what I've heard is it typically takes at least half as long as you were together. But then again, I've seen cases where somebody was with someone for less than two months and is still upset about it years later. And I've Oh my God, did you see the SNL skit this weekend? Where no, oh my I God. Well, because the, it was literally what you're talking about. This the skit, I can't tell you who it was. It was the football player. Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to look this shit up later. Bottom line is there was a woman on there and she was devastated that uh the guy she had she had went on one date with like 20 years ago. <laughs> had met somebody and now they're having a child and whatever. It's literally this thing. I mean, it's happens, funny right? because it's true. It happens. Uh, so yeah, so you don't have to be together for that long to get the intense attachment, but what is it? What does that look like in general? Do you think? Again, it's dependent. Sometimes you be with, you can be with someone for years and have emotionally checked out of the relationship a long time before the actual breakup comes. And then maybe even though you're out, technically just got out of a, five or 10 year relationship, you're kind of done mourning it. It's already, it just feels more complete. Could be a circumstance where one partner feels that way and the other one is completely shocked and felt like it came out of left field and it's gonna take a long time for them to recover. Relationships are as unique as the individuals that are in them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And those attachments, the quality of those attachments as you're describing oh, yeah. are, are gonna shape a lot of that. But also the the amount of emotional connection and how, yeah, has the grieving already happened? In other words, with, with in some of these maybe longer term relationships, folks have been together for maybe 10, 15 years. Or like, you know, there are circumstances where one party leaves someone for another person and maybe they're not thinking about the relationship that they've left behind because- they're in another relationship and that leaves the other party still mourning the relationship that was. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, it usually doesn't play out in a way that feels fair. Oh gosh. There's the sad news there, ladies and gentlemen, it may not, you know what I mean? It, that, and that is the thing, the fairness of it is it, it doesn't make sense to seem fair. It's a tough spot to be in. Uh, and so you may find yourself in these mismatches and you may think to yourself, I know I've heard this plenty of times, uh, Becca, like, I can't imagine if this person loved me that they could move on so quickly. I've heard that often. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that they would do that. Yeah. How could they have actually loved me and be done? You know, sometimes feels like cognitive dissonance. You just don't understand it. I think the only way that it ever seems sort of fair or evens out is when then the next time you're doing that to somebody else and you kind of can recognize the way it felt when it was done to you and still feel bad, but are still, you know, you can't help where you're at. And you're just kind of like, well, ugh. sometimes you're the heartbroken one and sometimes you're the heartbreaker. And it's, I think it, it sucks on both ends, probably worse on the end where you're heartbroken, but. Absolutely. And I think 
there's there's tends to be slight imbalance around that as well that experience in general uh particularly if there's betrayal can we talk about betrayal yes. real quick uh and absolutely we, we could literally we could have an entire episode just talking about moving forward from betrayal and we have talked about that on the show but in general what are the things that we need you know the folks who have been betrayed in other words who may be listening to this right now what are the things that you would want them to be thinking about in terms of just you know because they're probably thinking like i'm never going to be able to trust anybody again after this has happened to me most of the time if not all of the time in betrayal what people struggle to realize is that it's not about them it's about the person that betrayed them. It's not that something is wrong with you. It's that maybe something's wrong with them. Well, it was a decision because it was a decision, in other words, that they yeah. made the incorrect decision. Yeah, it was a decision that wasn't fair and it wasn't correct. For whatever reason, they didn't feel courageous enough to speak with you about the way that they were feeling. Beforehand. And yeah, so they wronged you. And that's not on you, that's on them. But Sometimes it feels like even though they're the one that did it, you're the one that's paying the price. And it's important to do the work after that, because if you don't do the work and you carry that into your next relationship, it will affect it in a way that's not healthy. And it will, it can, if you let it put a damper on every relationship you have for the rest of your life, unless you get some help, feel your feelings and move through them. Yeah, absolutely. This is one thing that comes up often uh, with clients in the past who have experienced betrayal is that uh, sometimes, you know, the trust in that new relationship is going to be tested, you know, intentionally, unintentionally, each and every day when there's an ask, you know, is the partner going to be there for them? Are they, can they rely on what the partner has actually said to them? And then often yeah. the other partner might say, well, this isn't me. This is this past stuff. Am I going to have to deal with this for the rest of my life? There's some truth to the reality that if you have been in a deep, meaningful relationship and betrayed, that in fact, you will have to do the work to keep that experience in perspective for yourself in the future so that it can be, it can be honored. It could be understood. It could be shared with your new partner, perhaps, likely, uh, and made sense of in that context, but it's not something that just goes away. You got to pay attention to it. Yeah, it's it has to be dealt with. And it's so, in that circumstance, I, I know I've said this before, but it really is most of the time not about the person that was betrayed. Greg, you and I worked together at the vet center years ago, and so frequently we would see veterans with PTSD that would cheat. That wasn't about their spouse. It was about them trying to make themselves feel better, whether through risk-taking behavior or as a way to kind of separate themselves from feeling an intensive connection. There are so many reasons that people cheat. And most of the time, it's not because there's something wrong with their spouse. Many couples do decide to separate after infidelity occurs, uh, which is their choice after that, a, a consequence, perhaps a natural consequence to that. And the couples who decide that they want to try to make it work, they need to actually spend not only time in atonement, you know, that person, whoever it is, but a, attunement. So there is some relationship work to do, but in general, no, it is, it's ultimately betrayal is about an individual's decision to behave in ways inconsistent with their values and the shared values and the in that relationship or family system. And that's it. That's it. I mean, it that's what it comes down to. So if you've just broken up because of a betrayal, you heard it here, spend time in a compassionate way, honoring your experience, feeling your feelings, maybe spending some time in individual therapy. It may seem unfair because you didn't do anything wrong, but you're in this situation dealing with the consequences. Still seek that help out and get that support. We're covering the bases here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thoughts? One thing that comes to mind for yeah. me is sometimes relationships that even when you know that you're when you're in them feel toxic and you know that they're toxic can feel sometimes even more difficult than a healthy relationships break up because it can just feel so addictive the toxic love roller coaster honestly yeah an addiction is probably the best way to describe the feelings that people are feeling during and after that type of relationship. Yeah, particularly, I mean, I guess specifically if there's a situations where there's manipulation occurring, there's gaslighting happening of these Yeah, light, the highs and the lows can be extremely addictive. The, I guess the dopamine and everything else is bumping uh, and reinforcement yes. is occurring. And I, 
that type of highs and lows, much like the anxious avoidant, what we spoke about in a previous episode, that type of relationship can make a healthy relationship feel boring. The intensity of it, the pull of it. One of the things that I would say about getting out of a toxic relationship that we're talking about right now and the difficulty of it is maybe losing a sense of their core self-image identity and worth, particularly if they've been in a relationship with someone who is contemptuous of them and devaluing of them uh, in general, which we know is abusive. Yeah. Negging, I think is the modern term for it. What is it called? What? Is it? what? Negging. Okay. All right. So negging is when somebody makes small but not insignificant comments about someone that makes them feel less than. And by tearing your partner down, you then build yourself up and you make your partner feel like they aren't worthy of you and therefore are more likely to cling to you. So maybe you would do that in a situation, typically the neggers may be insecure. They feel like their partner's out of their league. So they have to bring them down to their level by convincing them that they have all these flaws. All right. If that's happening to you right now, it needs to stop immediately. You need to set a very clear boundary of that. And hopefully you're already out of that relationship. But yeah, negging. Negging. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, if that's happening, that's a slow and sort of covert almost shaping of that that attachment scary really it's you know tends to be throwaway small comments in the moment they don't feel that bad but then they kind of build up and eat away at your self-esteem that's another reason if you're listen if you've just gotten out of a relationship right now and your self-esteem is low that's a beautiful reason to reach out to a, a provider, mental health provider in your local community and, and start the work that needs to happen to rebuild that along with having good friends and other things. Uh, Becca, I, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of healthy breaking up. You talked a little bit about it as well. Any other thoughts? We've talked a lot about unhealthy ways that things can roll and how we're trying to navigate them, but healthy breakups in general. A healthy breakup involves communication on both parties, also boundary setting. The boundaries can depend on the situation, but you know, you say that it's become apparent that what needs to happen is no contact. So having a conversation about that beforehand, maybe even setting an amount of time, like, okay, for three months, we're going to have no contact because that's what I need to heal. It's not that I'm not thinking about you. It's not that I don't care about you. It's not that I don't miss you, but I'm going to set that boundary. And, you know, respecting each other's boundaries and giving each other the time and space to move through what the pain of it. A thousand percent. I'm on board with everything you just said, uh, creating shared meaning about what each other needs more important, maybe even than just figuring out what went wrong or what, you know, what didn't work, but that's equally important. Maybe trying to create that meaning. Hey, listen, this is what we had. This is my thoughts this is my experience about this as much as you can with one another. But then, yeah, I mean, no contact is a relatively, I would say, potentially necessary thing for many, many couples, particularly younger couples, particularly folks who are connected on social media and online in these ways to really, in general, to be able to give your partner that time, at least as an option, three months, you suggest as an initial thought, uh, whatever that might be, because attachments require time away from each other to uh, shift. You know, people often I've seen try and convince themselves that they're fine and like it doesn't mess them up or their healing process up every time they have a conversation with their ex, but it does. You know, even if you think it doesn't, it does. It messes you up. It restarts your healing process. It's pouring salt in the wound. So I would recommend taking a break from that person ultimately. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm a fan of very clear boundaries, Becca, you know that. So I, 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 I won't disagree with you on anything you just said. I mean, I think, I think being clear about what it is you need and, and asking for it and then giving each other as much as you can. And to back to the point, it's not because you don't love that person or they're not, you're still, you're someone that you were best friends with, but it's be, maybe because you do care about that person so deeply that you need to give each other the space. And it might come down to, you know, hope, I mean, particularly coming out of toxic relationships where there needs to be some clear boundaries, you know, unfortunately, maybe even blocking them, you know, it, it depends. Things get a little wild Yeah. in toxic relationships with breakups. It's uh, boundaries are hard to maintain. The cycles of breakups going back to each other 
uh, some somewhat typical and those kind of so hard, clear, fast. Yeah. Cl yeah, I think it's a general good rule to follow. Yeah, it's a difficult rule, but it it works. Yeah. Last thought, Becca, because one of the things that aid us in being able to move forward after breakup is, I think, our ability to be single. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I'm coming to understand that in a very real, visceral way currently. But uh, in general, do you think being single, like actually staying single, would be a good skill to learn how to do if you are a person who tends to go from one relationship to the next? Oh, absolutely. Being single is a skill and it's an important skill. And honestly, I think to be in a healthy relationship, it's a good skill to know how to be single, to know how to make yourself happy and feel fulfilled without someone else. If you're going from relationship to relationship, you're putting yourself at risk of requiring external validation, of requiring somebody, yeah, requiring somebody and having that somebody be anyone. If there's just a hole that you're trying to fill and you'll fill it with anyone, that's how you get into unhealthy relationships. But having the ability to be single, having the ability to walk away and just be okay with yourself puts you in a much stronger position to meet someone that's right for you because you can wait until you meet them. And please do wait until you meet them. <laughs> yes. Wait until you meet them and look for those great matches. And it may be right now that you wouldn't even consider or think about dating again because you're in the in, in the midst of a breakup, right? But know that probably here's my here's my take on it based on what I understand. One to three years, one to three years particularly if you were in a marriage or a longer term relationship, it may take you uh, to do the work that needs to be done to be ready to do to get into a new relationship. If it's after three years, I don't know, I, there's definitely needs to be some kind of intervention. But being single, I am convinced from your this conversation uh, that for sure it is it is a skill that everybody needs to have, particularly my brothers out there, Vega, particularly my brothers. Yeah. Uh, Becca, where can people reach out to you or connect to you if they want to after hearing this episode? I'm on Instagram at it's Dr. Payne, that's P-A-Y-N-E, or on TikTok at Psych You Should Know. And yeah, please do reach out. Cheers. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show again. It was a delight to have thank you. Thank you, you so much for having me. Oh, God, the conversation was amazing. From my heart to yours, love each other fiercely. we we'll talk to you soon, everybody. Peace.